filtering in some questions into the chat as you were talking. So if anyone wants to, I'll just scroll back. And if you have a question, feel free to pop it in there and see if we can get to as many as possible. All right, here, here we go. What does the 2% estimate of global energy include? More specifically, how is energy defined? Does it include heating and steam, which typically includes natural gas and coal? This was from early on in your presentation. Right. Okay, um, if you think of a pie chart, think of electricity as being one slice of the pie chart, okay? And then all the non-electrical uses, for example, fuels for, uh, for vehicles, for instance, um, in many jurisdictions, home heating might not be electrical. Uh, all of the energy that is used commercially, um, uh, the, the nuclear contributes 10% of the electricity, but it only contributes 2% of the total energy pie. Does that make sense? It does to me. <laughs> uh, all right. Next question, based on the example of the Germany example, what alternative energy option displaced the nuclear power option to provide baseload power? Yeah, they, uh, it's often been pointed out and truly enough, both before and after the beginning of the phase out that Germany does burn a good deal of coal and uh, they, uh, but so does everybody else. Canada also burns a fair bit of coal we're trying to get off of it, but we still are. Um, and the US burns coal, and so they even burn coal to run their enrichment plants. Germany has, however, cut down quite markedly on their burning of coal. And they're using mostly, more and more, they're depending on the renewables. And they're finding that the renewables have been far more successful than they originally anticipated, which has allowed them to stay on schedule, unlike nuclear construction projects, which often fall off the rails, they're staying on schedule to have all the reactors shut down by the end of 2022. They only have six reactors left running, which is a huge uh, come down. At the time of the Fukushima accident, there were 17 reactors running. So uh, it's mostly renewables uh, and increasingly renewables. Um, and the base load is, most people who have looked at the renewables have pointed out that base load, the whole concept of base load power is becoming obsolete. We need to have smart interactive grids, which do not depend upon large chunks of baseload power. It's sort of similar in a way to comparing the old fashioned uh, uh, computers that were air conditioned in separate rooms uh, in huge cabinets um, compared with desktop computers, which are now very, very flexible and mobile. We need to have grids which are smart grids and which do not depend so much on the concept of baseload. The idea of baseload is that you have one reactor or one dam or one power plant that is producing electricity 24 seven. And it's only during peak demands or during shutdowns that you need to call on other sources of energy. That's a, that's a paradigm that is now undergoing a lot of change. Thank you. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat about where they can see the recordings of these presentations. So before we go to the next question, I'll just say that I popped the link to the SPL YouTube channel uh, into the chat. Um, so you can click on that now if you'd like to go and open the page, but also if you search YouTube, Saskatoon Public Library, you'll get to our YouTube channel. There is a playlist of all of the past uh, sustainability speaker series presentations, including Anne Coxworth's, which would be a good companion to go watch after you've, you've seen this one, because she spoke in May about um, small nuclear reactors. So, Let's see here, the next question. What options are there for recycling spent fuel in Canada and globally? Yeah, uh, uh, recycling spent fuel is, is a misnomer. 
what it, the spent fuel is uh, is mostly unburnt uranium, and uh, it contains uh, hundreds of, of uh, uh, these fission products I mentioned, which are intensely radioactive, constituting the bulk of the radioactive waste. And then there are the transuranic elements such as plutonium. Now, in the Kandu reactor, for example, uh, the plutonium in the irradiated fuel is just a tiny fraction of 1%. It's uh, perhaps 0.4%. I'm not sure the exact number, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.4%. So uh, what you're doing is you're extracting plutonium and you're using that as fuel. You're not recycling the spent fuel. The spent fuel itself, the 99.6% of it is not being recycled. Now, uh, uh, the danger in this, and there's been a lot of written about this over the years, is that if you start making plutonium into an article of commerce, like everything else, like oil and gas and so on, then sooner or later, it's going to fall into the hands of criminals. Everything that is traded commercially falls into the hands of criminals, whether it's money, whether it's diamonds, whether it's cocaine, whatever it is, it's going to fall into the hands of criminals. And then you have uh, the possibility of uh, uh, not just improvised bombs, uh, such as we had in Afghanistan, but improvised nuclear bombs, because nuclear explosives allow, make it possible to make improvised nuclear bombs. And this is a very, very scary prospect. It's called the plutonium economy. And so the implications of so-called recycling, very, a very uh, a comfortable word for a very scary concept, is that you want to make plutonium into an article of commerce, and that means it's going to be circulating, and that means anybody can get their hands on it ultimately. That, that's, why, that's why it has not been considered an option for Canada uh, up until now. In fact, in fact, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited did try and get a multi-billion dollar investment in plutonium reprocessing back in 1977. We have this on our website, the seminar they gave, but, um, but they were forbidden from doing so. Uh, the the uh, President Jimmy Carter, the US President Jimmy Carter, who himself was trained as a nuclear engineer in the uh, nuclear Navy of the US, he uh, banned reprocessing uh, plutonium extraction in the United States. And similarly, Canada didn't exactly outright ban it, but made it clear that they were not gonna allow it to happen here. Uh, without making a pronouncement, a public pronouncement about it. So it was effectively banned in Canada as well at that time. Um, can you explain what does it mean to be a tier one country? I don't exactly know what that means. So, Anne, do you know what that means? What is tier one? I didn't use that expression. Put her on the spot. Um, maybe you can answer, how do waste management practices compare between nuclear and renewable power options? That's kind of goes back to the previous question. Well, if you wanted to be a wag, you could say, as I did to some nuclear engineers in Salzburg, Austria years ago, <laughs> we know what to do with the used sunbeams and we know what to do with the used gusts of wind. Uh, <laughs> they're harmless. They just go on to turn more windmills. Um, but I know what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that in building these plants, you need to use some very dangerous materials, which are called rare earths. And these materials are, uh, some of them very toxic and have to be handled very carefully. Uh, however, they're not radioactive. And as a result, they can be recycled. The reason we can't recycle spent fuel really, and the reason we can't recycle the materials from the construction of a nuclear reactor is because they have become too dangerous for anybody to use. And so these are not recyclable materials. Uh, some people have said that nuclear power is the ultimate in the throwaway society, because no matter how fine the, the, uh, the steel, the, the, the finest steel in the world is used in nuclear plants, and it becomes radioactive garbage after it's used because you cannot reuse it again. So that's the opposite of recycling. Now, in the case of uh, renewables, they do have say, dangerous materials that must be used, but they can be recycled and should be recycled. And they're not radioactive, they can safely be recycled, but uh, they have to be handled very carefully. And that should be built in to a renewable future. The idea that all these uh, materials should be recuperated and recycled and reused. 
We cannot do that with nuclear. Recycling is a misnomer with regard to nuclear. All right. Uh, here's, uh, the, here's one. Ooh, one of the current selling points of the SMNRs is that they will recycle nuclear waste. How realistic is this? Also, in the 1950s, they were worried about not having enough uranium and the idea of MOX, MOX fuel was promoted. Do any reactors use that now? Why was it not pursued? Uh, you know, from, from my perspective uh, and from the perspective of my organization, we believe that this whole nuclear adventure has been misguided. Uh, at the beginning, it was thought reasonably enough that because nuclear energy, because nuclear forces are the strongest forces in the universe, surely we should be able to use those for peaceful purposes. But we have discovered much to our chagrin that you can't use them safely because you produce problems which outlast uh, not only human history, but, but any kind of concept of time that we can have any realistic handle on. And the result is that it's what, why would we want to promote a technology that routinely mass produces the most deadly, radi the most deadly poisonous materials ever conceived on earth? Why would we want to promote such a technology? So the idea of expanding this production is uh, the opposite of where we should be going. We should be phasing it out just as we're phasing out fossil fuels. Uh, as somebody has said, we shouldn't jump from the, uh, the carbon frying pan into the nuclear fire. Uh, we should find a genuine alternative to both. And in fact, CCNR, the organization that I'm president of, has consistently from the very beginning of its founding in 1970, uh, uh, can't even remember right now, we, we were incorporated in 1978. We were founded in 1975, I believe. Um, we have consistently said that we believe that the, the future lies with renewable energy. The, the future lies in living off our energy income, which is coming in every year. No matter, we can't even stop it. The wind and the sun just keeps on coming no matter what. We can't use it up. So these are genuinely renewable. And stop using renewable resources. It's like, it's like living off our capital instead of living off our income. And uh, Amory Levins, uh, who wrote the book Soft Energy Paths, did an excellent job of explaining all of this. And here in Canada, we got the government of Canada to cooperate in doing a soft energy path study for Canada, which was published in 12 volumes uh, one volume for each of the 10 provinces, one volume for the territories, and one overall volume summarizing it all. And this was done in the last century. Uh, it should be done again, because now we know a lot more than we did then at that time. And by the way, that was, all, that was assuming a lot of GDP growth. It was assuming a lot of population growth. It was accepting the growth figures that the government of Canada itself was putting forward. Uh, and we had an energy scenarios for Canada that would not would involve the phasing out of fossil fuels and nuclear, and uh, turning completely to renewables. Okay, lots of activity in the chat, and we've got some time left. Um, I want to add that Gordon has also. Uh, let us know that you'll be putting your uh, PDF of your slides up on your website and that we'll get the that shared on the that link shared on the SES Facebook. So if you want to go through this again but can't access the video, there will also be that option for you. Um, I have one. We'll take one more question. And I've got one here. Uh, ROI, return on investment on wind technologies, renewable versus nuclear. What is the ratio? Obviously nuclear is not renewable and extremely costly for the taxpayer, but wind technologies are getting cheaper. So what are you, your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not an economist, and so I don't know what the number is. That's a very interesting question. I'm sure it would be a whole lot better. Um, because uh, we, we've played around with um, the idea of utilities, for example, investing uh, in homeowners uh, doing uh, renovations. 
if home, the, the problem is access to capital. Utility companies have a lot of access to capital, which homeowners don't have. If the utility companies were to invest in homeowners, saying, we will advance you the money to do uh, energy improvements, and you will pay us back by paying us the difference on your energy bill between what you paid before and what you'll pay after those improvements. You, so you want, your bill will not actually go up. And the payback time is usually a couple of years. You can pay back that whole investment in two or three years, which is much, much faster than any investments in centralized uh, facilities, uh, which is measured in decades, not in years. I imagine the same thing would be true of wind uh, and solar, but uh, it wouldn't be just a few years. It would be a longer period of time. But I feel intuitively that it would probably pay for itself within a decade uh, in terms of return on investment, which means you then have that money ready to reinvest in even more wind power and solar. Whereas with nuclear, if you invest in the nuclear plant, you don't even start making any uh, profit at all, any in revenue until the plant is built. And that might take 10 to 15 years. So you're paying the interest on that loan all the time. That money is less and less available. And then when you start paying it back, it's gonna take you quite a bit of time to repay that investment. Only then do you start making a net profit. Only then can you reinvest it. But guess what? No sooner do you have some extra money to reinvest, but you have to put aside money for the waste management. And you have to also, which is going to cost $26 billion in Ontario to, they estimate, to uh, find a repository for the high level waste. And then there's the dismantling of the reactors, which may cost up to a billion dollars each. So the money that you actually recuperate has to go towards future expenses, which wind power and solar energy do not have. Someone in the chat also just said, excellent answer, A plus, thank you. So <laughs> I, there's some appreciative audience members here tonight. Um, I want uh, to plug, sorry. Could I, could I just mention that it, my email address is a, a matter of public record and it, it is ccnr at web.ca. If anybody wants to send me uh, your questions, I'll be glad to answer. CCNR at, what was that? Web, W-E-B dot C-A. Now that's in the chat. If everybody, if anyone wants to see that. Next month, our next sustainability speaker series event is going to be Future of Climate Action in Saskatchewan on November 16th. Just want to mention that in case anybody wants to um, attend. And we're gonna take maybe one more question. I said that one was gonna be the last question, but... Oh yeah, it looks like we've got one more. Do you wanna do one more, Gordon? Sure. Okay. Um, is not nuclear power the cover story for the infrastructure needed for nuclear weapons? So <laughs> I was gonna ask and answer, but go, yes. Uh, actually, I, I think it is. Uh, I think it is. And uh, uh, just, to, just to give you an example, uh, you know, the trouble is that when you have enrichment plants, you're, anybody with an enrichment plant, like Iran, for example, Iran has an enrichment plant, a uranium enrichment plant. And that's why everybody is on pins and needles, because that means that they can make a bomb uh, out of highly enriched uranium if they choose to do so. So enrichment is a very dangerous technology. Similarly, plutonium uh, separation is a very dangerous technology. Now, if you didn't have nuclear power, you wouldn't need to have either one of those technologies unless you were interested in bombs. So uh, in my view, getting rid of nuclear power and exchanging it for renewables would make it much easier to phase out of nuclear weapons as well. But in the meantime, the nuclear power industry gets benefits from the nuclear weapons industry and vice versa. For example, um, um, well, just to give you one example, um, in England, Rolls-Royce has gone on record as publicly saying that 
they're very happy to see small modular reactors come online because they need more nuclear people in the weapons business. And so in order to have enough nuclear candidates to work in the nuclear weapons field, it's helpful for them to have a, a pool to draw upon. And therefore it's helpful for them to have peaceful nuclear power. Um, also in the United States, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which, gen which generates electricity for consumers, also produces tritium for nuclear weapons. So they have, they have explicitly used their reactors, which are commercial reactors for dual purpose. Both for, uh, the tritium is, is one of the, the main spark plugs in modern nuclear weapons. It, it more than doubles the explosive power of the bomb. Um, at Chernobyl, many people may not know that Chernobyl, the Chernobyl reactor that melted down in 1986 was a dual purpose reactor. It was intended not only to produce electricity, but also to produce plutonium for bombs, as was the reactor that suffered a serious nuclear accident in 1957 in Northern England. The Sellafield reactor also was a dual purpose reactor. It was used by the British, both for electricity and for plutonium for bombs. So uh, this is, uh, uh, th there's quite a synergy between them and I don't think one could exist without the other. Uh, I, think, I think the only way to shut this whole thing down is to shut it all down. And as a matter of fact, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau in 1978 said to the United Nations that if we're serious about having a nuclear weapons free world, we should start with a strategy of suffocation by choking off the vital oxygen upon which the arms race feeds. And that is the nuclear explosive materials, highly enriched uranium and plutonium. Now, if you were to in fact choke off that supply of enrichment and, your, and plutonium, you would not have a peaceful nuclear industry either because most of the nuclear reactors in the world require one or the other. So they do go hand in hand. They are like Siamese twins. And uh, I, I think we've allowed ourselves to be mesmerized because the fancy sounding words and the terms that we don't quite understand makes us feel, well, we're really not competent to deal with this. We've got to leave it to the experts. But you know what? In the US, they have the idea that the military is ultimately too important to leave to the military, to the generals. You have to have civilian control. Well, in a similar way, um, nuclear is much too important to leave to the experts. Ordinary people have to become involved. Ordinary people have to insist on democratic processes Ordinary people have to insist that there must be public, discernible, transparent processes by which these decisions are being made and that all the alternatives are being weighed and all the cards are being put on the table. That's what we need.